What is your name? Paula. Paula. Have we met before, Paula? No. So how is it that you find yourself here tonight, Paula? Um, Stephanie's my roommate. Uh huh. And she brought me. Okay. And did she kidnap you? No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, kind of. No, that's not true. She's been talking about you for a while. We've been living together for almost a year. And and I think a week ago I mentioned when you were, sh you were coming next that I wanted to come, right? Yeah, she really wanted to come. I wanted to come, yeah. Yeah. And so what fuels your interest in coming to places like this? Mm -hmm. The search for myself. It's been, we were even talking, uh, coming here in the car, how it's been something so uh, natural and organic in both of our paths to just wanting to understand ourselves and finding ourselves in a so called spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I'm always interested in learning. From people who know more. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having me here. Well, you're most welcome. So I'm intrigued by your search for yourself. And do you have any recollection of when that search began? Was it tied to anything specific? I do have one collection. Uh, it started at a very early age. Um, we're from Brazil. And, uh, Which part of Brazil are you from? Campinas. Uh, it's close to Sao Paulo. Mm -hmm. And I remember being really young, around seven years old, mm -hmm. and um, starting to understand how different life is for people. Mm -hmm. And um, and I remember my mom actually telling me, there's not much we can actually do, but we can always pray. And I remember that I would pray for myself to have things I wanted, for my family to be doing well. Mm -hmm. But then for the first time, I was like, oh, so I can pray for people to also feel good. Anyway, it just expanded for the first time my concept of whatever language I could have to something that was beyond me, mm -hmm. not with my adult words, seeing it right now. Yeah. And from there I started writing. Mm -hmm. And that was my journey started through writing. I was actually writing. And you were writing fiction or writing, no. writing about your experiences? Yeah, writing about, I started with little poems from that time, like, how is life so unfair? Mm -hmm. and, uh -huh. and it went through, I still write to this day, kind of journaling nowadays, I think. Mm -hmm. But am I answering your question? Yes, you are. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, so that led me through a life of living in five different countries, meeting a lot of people, always trying to do things. What countries have you lived in? Um, Brazil. Yes. And then England, mm -hmm. Italy, mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. and now here. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> and, uh, and I've studied a few things. The more I study, the more I see how much I have to study to understand. I want to study. And in Brazil, I studied a lot of Rudolf Steiner, mm -hmm. anthroposophy. Mm -hmm. um, I actually came to LA through yoga, um, particularly this yoga called Nam Yoga. I've done Vipassana some, a few times, a handful of times. And um, yeah. My mom is a Vedanta student in Brazil. We have a really good teacher. Mm -hmm. I was never committed, but I, I, I've read things. Mm -hmm. And um, in this past one year, um, Stefan introduced me to the concept of Advaita Vedanta. And we've been, we talk a lot. She's a very good student. Mm 
<laughs> Very knowledgeable little girl. <laughs> We're authentic. Yeah. And I think resonate it's been resonating with my heart. So did you come tonight with any specific questions? On your ride down here in your discussions, did anything? Not really, but that now that you mentioned, um, I have always, I always have a question, like, should I stay in this place where I am, or should I go? Because mm -hmm. I've moved a lot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this question is, I have to make a decision, kind of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I think my question would be how how to fill this gap inside yourself once you start moving and you leave your homeland it's never the same you kind of never feel home there's always something should I go should I go back mm -hmm. when am I actually going when am I actually going back mm -hmm. So, this presumes that you have some influence mm -hmm. in what happens. Oh, yeah. And this is what we, in this teaching, what I call the living teaching, one of the things we look at is what is it that is, in fact, moving you around? Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the initial response is, well, me, of course. I mean, I, I decide whether I'm going to go ultimately or stay or that it's my decision. And as far as it goes, that's true. But when we start to look into what is it that goes into your decision, In the first place, how is it that a decision comes to, to be? That's one area of inquiry that can be really interesting. And so the next area of inquiry that can be interesting is to look at the nature of decision itself. So, do you know the riddle of the five frogs? No. There are five frogs sitting on a log, and three of them decide to jump off. How many are left? Two. No. Five. They decided to jump, but they didn't do it. <laughs> now, I don't know if you, your experience with decisions as resonates with that. Sometimes. Yes. Many times. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we decide things and something else happens. We don't do what we decide. I, just, I remember when I was smoking cigarettes, I decided to quit smoking cigarettes 50 times. A <laughs> hundred times. <laughs> then, on the hundred and first time, I decided to quit smoking and I did. I went, ah, my decision is what caused it. <laughs> Which is very effective as long as you are capable of ignoring the hundred times before where the decision did not lead to the outcome. So that claim that the decision is the causal agent in the event is worth looking at. Yes. Now, the decision... The 101st decision was part of the event. So we, we're, we're not throwing out decision making entirely. It's just to call into question what, what is it? And are there any singular causes to things? So one of the things you'll find, and I don't know whether was brought to your attention, that in this teaching, 
the answers aren't delivered to you. The answers you have to find yourself. All that the teaching does is asks various questions that may be stimulating for you to begin to look in areas that you have not perhaps looked in before. And sometimes when you look, you see. Other times you look and, and you don't see. And I, I can't guarantee in any way what you might see or what might happen. Only that what is here is a stimulus to a certain kind of looking. Sounds good. Now, you you would be very fair to say, how does that help me decide whether I'm going to go to Brazil or go to um, Hawaii or go to Ibiza? I don't know. You know, I mean, you, I would say it's not useful at all. The teaching is useless. In that regard, it is completely useless. But you may begin to look at the decision-making process itself. And that can have its own kind of yield. That is what we sometimes talk around about around here as freedom. Freedom is a state of being in which you are free. It isn't that you are free to do this. In fact, you are not free to do most everything. You can't flap your wings and fly. You can't hold your breath underwater for more than a few minutes. There's a billion things that you cannot do. There's a but. But the freedom is in the recognition of what is. The freedom is in the recognition of what you truly are. And so when you talked about this question of uh, being curious about yourself, this to me is the essence of the living teaching. It's the curiosity of what am I? How how do, do, does this thing, this thinking, feeling, acting apparatus, connect to like the other ones and the, the world at large? And I mean, how does it all fit in? What's what am I? And that recognition, when it comes of what you are, answers all the questions in the seeing of what your true nature is. Or more precisely, it simply dissolves the questions. It doesn't actually answer them. You don't suddenly have a vast supply of knowledge about, you know, uh, a huge lexicon of answers. It's simply that the questions evaporate. The fundamental question about what you are and how this is. What is your name? Kimberly. Hello, Kimberly. Hi. How are you today? I'm doing okay. Yeah? Yeah. A little unsettled, but... Unsettled? In what sense? Oh, I'm, I'm kind of like, um, I don't remember what your name is. Paula. Paula. Um, trying to figure out if I want to 
stay here or leave. Uh -huh. In the room, you mean? No. Oh. <laughs> no. Oh. <laughs> um, L.A. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, um, it feels a bit much. Too scared to stay, too scared to leave. It feels that way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I understand. And so this fear, if you can begin to, to look at it, yes. and unfortunately, often the, the, the impetus for a decision mm -hmm. uh, blocks the, the contemplative energy to, to look underneath it, to say, Ooh, What's actually going on here? What's what's responsible for the, for the fear? The fear is obviously tied to the indecision. So you say, okay, well, I, if I make a decision, then I won't be fearful. Then I, I will have an answer. I will know what to do, and, and everything will be great. And I won't have this fear. Yeah. But the fact is, you've been afraid before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and. Things and you, you've moved or done this, I've done or, it, yeah. and then the fear arises once again in the next situation. So here, what we're looking at is what is the fear itself tied to? <laughs> My whole life. <laughs> in a sense, in a sense, that's probably true, because because. The tool we, we use in this teaching to, to talk about this is a concept of what I call the false sense of authorship, which is a sense that I am an independent entity that is responsible for my thoughts, feelings, and actions. So that's the sense. That sense that I am the one responsible, it's up to me. I feel so heavy. Is really heavy. Yeah. It's really heavy because you have literally the weight of the world. Because you have to make the quote right decision. You don't need to can make any kind of fucked up wrong decision. You gotta make the right decision. Yeah. One that doesn't ruin the rest of your life and, and <laughs> utterly destroy everything that's going to come next. You want to make the right decision. One that's going to provide you with happiness and satisfaction and peace and, and love and, and care. But in order to determine that, you have to be able to foretell the future. I cannot do that. That's a problem. It is. So, I mean, and so when you feel this impetus that I must in somehow divine the proper future move, the, the present move, which will, will provide a positive future, and yet not have the resources to foretell the future, no, then... I it's all tied to what's my work situation going to look like? What's um, do I do, do I buy something? Should I, I mean, there's all this other stuff attached to it, and so that energy right now feels really heavy. Yeah. So that's all. But all you that see, that's stuff. all. The, that's all the tinsel. That's all the the stuff that's attaching yes. to the fundamental problem, which is I must somehow discern the proper answer to this, 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 and this. Because I think I'm an author. Because <laughs> the feeling is, and it's not a thought, it's not conceptual, it's a sense of having that power. And because you are independent. Yeah, that power feels frightening right now. What makes it frightening is you don't have enough of it. 
<laughs> That's the frightening part. It, it's scary. I, yeah. I seem to have some power. I can, you know, find my house and I can, you know, I got drive my here. car. You got, got here, here and you can do yeah. this and that and the other thing. So I have some powers. Uh -huh. Obviously. You know, and you can think and you can reason and you can you, you can have relationships with people and, and you can do all those kinds of things. You have, you have capacity. But it's a limit, you know, very basically in your guts that your power is limited. And yet the demand that is being placed on you by this sense of authorship is to be omniscient, to be God, to know the, somehow the right thing. Yes. Yes, it makes it um, fearful to make a decision. Yes. But that's also making a decision. Yes. Oh, I mean, we can, we, we can say that. And when we look at it, every action is a decision because it's, you know, a decision not to do this, Versus that. Every action is, quote, a decision in that regard. Everything. Everything that you do. You know what's coming to me as we're talking is um, maybe a sense of being able to trust that it's just going to be okay. But it's, you can't because you know from your life experience sometimes it turns to shit. <laughs> you know. <laughs> You know, it, it, it might not, this thing might not be okay. You know, I may mean not. It, it, it really might not. So trusting it just sets you up to be resentful. <laughs> 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 should I not trust? I feel like if I could trust it would go better. But you're, are you saying it would not? Go well, better? momentarily, yes. <laughs> you know, you put your faith, you put your trust that, you know, God is going to take care of me, you know, and then something horrible happens and you go, but God, I trusted you. <laughs> how could you, how could you do this to me? You see, and that's a common refrain from people who, quote, trusted God and then got screwed over. So the only solution to that is that, well, God actually has something better for me in mind. So this is just a way station of crap on the way to a, a, a more wonderful future, you know, maybe in the next life. I mean, that's, that's, how, they, that's how they sustain it. This is how this gets sustained. Well, yeah. You, maybe so. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. So... Since we can't, since it's all off stage, we can we can tell whatever story we want and say yes, this model works because even though it obviously doesn't work here, it works off stage. It works in the next life, and you know where you can't verify that it works. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it kind of reminds me of Ronald Reagan when he said, "Trust but verify." Yes, it, absolutely, absolutely. So, what? So, trust is not what we're okay. talking about in this teaching. Okay. You know, what we're what we're talking about in this teaching is to come back to like what is. So, what is, and most specifically, what is you? What <laughs> are you? Shit. <laughs> what are you? At, in your essence, what has manifested itself as you? With your qualities and your characteristics and, and your beautiful stellar qualities and all of your secret little hidden bullshit. Uh -huh. You know, I mean, what is, what is responsible for this that's the questions we're asking. That's we're pointing to that and saying, what's what's going on? What is really going on here? I don't know. That's a really <laughs> good place to start. Not knowing 
means, okay, there's an opportunity for recognition. It's like, I don't know. And if there's curiosity that's attached to the, I don't know. So it's not just, I don't know and I'll never know and I can't possibly know because it's not knowable. You know, which is a form of knowing. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know that I can't know, you know. So as long as there's not that kind of certainty, as there's openness, then we see. Truly, we, we begin to, to look at, like, what is this? Because what you know, what you really know, is that there is something here. What was your name again? Kimberly. Kimberly. This Kimberly... sense is attached to something. The sense, you know, the sense, I'm Kimberly. Okay, okay, I'm Kimberly. And what is what is underlying this Kimberliness? What is, I mean, y yeah, I mean, there's a body, and there's memories, and there's thoughts, and there's desires, and there's feelings, and there's all of these things. All of that's Yes, part of the Kimberliness. Okay. Very much part of the Kimberliness. Yes. Now, we, when you can, when you can begin to recognize these, you know, sort of the features of the Kimberliness, mm -hmm. then you can begin to go even deeper than that. How is it that these features have come to be? What is, what is fueling the features? See, and so it's by going progressively deeper, you may come to some kind of vision, some kind of recognition of what it is that underlies the surface of Kimberly. Does not, and is, is a vital aspect of Kimberly. It's not that you have to transcend your Kimberliness in order to know that. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah the, but Inherent in your Kimberliness. It's an interesting yes. exploration. Yes, it is. It's kind of some, um, instead of the fear, it's kind of exciting. Mm -hmm. oh, I wonder what that is. Exactly. The fear only comes in when there's a sense that I must, Yes. I must, it's up to me to figure it out. It is up to me to get the answer. It is up to me to, when that enters in, which is what I call this sense of authorship, that yes. it's up to me. When that enters in, then the suffering mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it feels really tight. That's right. Yeah, it's constriction. Right. Yes. As that eases, there is expansion. Yeah. And that expansion expands to include Kimberly. But as a contraction, when there's a contraction, Kimberly is all there is. <laughs> it's a it's lot all of about Kimberly. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot, and it's I mean, and it's all about Kimberly. What Kimberly does, how Kimberly acts, what Kimberly's going to do, make, you know, and then this is all this tight, constricted sense, and that's the fear that. That you're talking about, which is suffering. Uh, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. Uh, there's a long line. <laughs> okay. Of course, no one wants to suffer. Yes. Truly, no one wants to suffer. like I've played that part. Probably all of us have played the suffering role well. <laughs> well, yes, I mean, suffering ha is, is very much the human condition because at around the age of two years old, there develops this sense of being an independent entity. 
and, and what arises out of this sense of being independent is that I author things. I'm responsible for what is happening as the author, not as the doer of it. See, so we make a distinction between doing and author. So, you, you make, you do all kinds of actions. The question is, are you the author of the action? Or are you the instrument, the doer, through which the action happens? If you're the author, then it is incumbent upon you always to do the best action and really to do it perfectly. And in fact, this is not only an internal message, but it's a societal one as well. I mean, you start getting it when you're two. It's up to you. You make it happen. It's your yeah. responsible. You, you, you. And if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. And blah, 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 blah. And it's all you. So we're not authors. That's the question. Are we authors? Are we, are we doers? Uh, in the definition that we've do stuff we, of the word, yes. I, I, I ask that only because in other sorts of um, things I've listened to, you are not the doer, which and so maybe they mean not the author. So that's it's language that's thing. language thing. It's a language thing. Sure. And so my guru, this fellow Ramesh Balsetra, he was very much when his language was, "You are not the doer." And in the years that I was very closely associated with him, I watched people's responses to that and recognized what, that often there was confusion. And because he was, he was completely clear on what he was saying, but I could see what was being received by the word often threw people off. And so, through a, a, a series of events, the, this term author appeared through actually through a, a translator when I was in Spain talking. And the translator used the, the word author. author to, because we were making the the distinction between doing and authoring. And so he, and then that term was, became the one that I prefer yes. because it is more precise to point you to exactly what it is about the doing that brings the suffering. Yeah, I, I saw you on, um Buddha at the gas pump, uh -huh. and you talked about that, I and I liked that. It fit. I liked that, but not being the author fit better. It just, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yes. <clears throat> and it's very much. It, it was very much a question of language with my guru. There's other people who subsequently started talking about it without that quality of understanding, and then a lot of confusion ensued about the doing. <laughs> and so, we, in my language, we are the doers. Yes. That, that is what defines us. When we stop doing, they come and they take us away because we start to stink. <laughs> because that means we're dead. When we stop doing anything, then that is death. The absence of any doing whatsoever. But the, I don't know how you said it, but it, we're just 
an instrument in what's passing through us. And we are not just an instrument. We are the instrument through which the universe functions. You see? I mean, the whole thing, this universe is functioning through us. And it is as, as profound and significant and meaningful as the rotation of the planets. It is that much connected to everything. It's powerful. It is indeed. Young Che says, uh, Wayne, you never seem annoyed by tardy visitors. Is it that Wayne doesn't get irritated easily? Or is it the time has no bearing on the final understanding? <laughs> um, well, first of all, it is not that I never get annoyed by tardy visitors. There, the over the years that I have done this, there have been people who have come uh, characteristically tardy uh, or consistently tardy, and um, I have been annoyed by that. Now, I mean, some people come tardy, like Lily, because she, she doesn't get off, to, off work till 7.30. So, I mean, that doesn't annoy me at all. The, but people who uh, simply come late because they're, quote, late people, uh, I do get annoyed with. And have at times said something to them about you know res respecting the group, but um, it has absolutely nothing whatsoever to do with any spiritual principles. It's purely my <laughs> personality, and you know what I feel is how you know how I feel about things. Nothing more than that. There's no inherent truth that is being violated by people who are being tardy. <laughs> because the understanding is, you know, that. We are all reacting, responding, in accordance with our natures. And so there is never any sense of you should not do what you do. It is simply that I may not like what you do. And in this context, I have a little influence. A little bit. And so I can make my desires known. And to a certain degree, I can enforce them. But it is all done with the total recognition that it is playing out in a way that it could not be other than it is. Mm -hmm. My name is Julia. Hello, Julia. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. We've met before. Yes, I know. You have a good memory. <laughs> this book that you're uh, 
We should put it in audio format. Thank you so much for having that done because that's why I listen to it. Mm -hmm. This short attention span has been labeled as ADHD before, and uh -huh. when listening to books is so much easier. Than okay. And so it was. It was like just she and I met at a thing that I may have mentioned to you before called the Sedona Method, and it's kind of rooted in non-duality, non but not really. Yes and no. I mean, it's kind of like points to that. But um, they used to say, be not the doer. I'm like, what the hell does that mean? You know? And it was this book that you wrote that really helped me to understand that much better, you know, much better. In fact, I, I, I have a meme that I, I shared. I think you get a laugh out of it. It just it's got Kermit the Frog with an x-ray of a hand inside the puppet. And it says, what I'm about to tell you is going to change your life forever. You sure you want to know it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess that, that there is a little tiny question that I have, and it probably doesn't matter because I don't, I guess I'm, but since I'm here anyway, um, I've come to really deeply, I feel like what you did, said it really helped me to understand that, that there's nobody here to author or anything. Sam Harris, I presume you're, well, not that, but that there's no, uh, I'm not the author. Okay. Okay. Um, it's, to me, it sounds also like the idea of no free will. And Sam Harris is another author, and he really like helped me drive that point home even deeper, I felt. Now, there was somebody that I heard once, and they said, well, you're not responsible. So absolutely not, not responsible. Nobody is responsible. And then somebody said, but you're accountable. And like, and that kind of makes sense, because, you know, I might You may be accountable. Maybe. Not necessarily. O.J. Simpson. Right. <laughs> Touche. Right? Okay. Yeah. You might be accountable. You might be accountable yeah, for your action. Better, you might be. You might not have to be. <laughs> and there are people, there are people in prison for crimes that they did not commit. That's right. So accountability is kind of not so rigid. It's my observation. I mean, that's, you can... that's a very good point. That helps actually. Okay. Yeah. So and there's no. And it's like I guess I thought I thought about it. I was like, well, I see one. I don't know if you want to call it a path or a process or whatever, but most of what I've been if you want to call it a doing, mm -hmm. is simply asking who gives a shit or who's the doer or if you can find the one and, mm -hmm. and all that. And with that, with regards to accountability, we could say, well, there's no one to be accountable also. You can say that. I mean, but the, the, the question then is who's saying that? Right. I mean, who am I talking to? What's going on here? I mean, that's yeah. kind of the... The open question that we're we're exploring in this teaching is like you and I are having a conversation. Right. We can say, well, there's nobody here, and the conversation is just happening. Yeah. Nobody's talking. Nobody's nobody. Yeah. It's there's just some. I mean, the hoops you've got to jump through linguistically to get there is uh -huh. a little rough for me. Right. So I. <laughs> I prefer to say there is you and there is me. I'm Wayne, and I'm sorry, I'm Julia, horrible. Sorry. And, and there's Julia, mm -hmm. and this describes something that But I'm exists. not something that they were describing. So th then the question, th then that open that gives us a beginning to say, what's Julia? I mean, what is Julia? What is Wayne? What is this? What's going on here? And to to simply dismiss the whole thing and say, well, there's nothing and it's all, or it's all everything and it's all consciousness, it's consciousness talking to consciousness is great. <laughs> but now what's happening? In a, in real, like, terms, like in terms of vision, in terms of recognition, what is happening? 
And that's what we're concerned with, what it, this true seeing of what you are. Which you could probably never really see, because if I'm like, I guess I, it, the path is then, well, there's no path, but the, the, the influences that, the, and, and for lack of a better word, I have witnessed, okay? Uh, personal pronouns are fine. I, I have, okay. Yeah, I, it's not, you're not going to be punished for saying, <laughs> for I, saying or, I, I or me. Uh, yeah, okay. there's no non-duality police here. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. It was about um, when, what a statement, I guess, that really seemed to help me a lot was truth is that which never changes. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like all that's real is eternal, all that's false will change, find out what remains. It's like what's true is changeless, right? So I would say, well, what is the truth of what I am? So what it, you know, but what doesn't change? What doesn't change? That's right. Right. Because the everything that is manifest changes. Right. So I can't be this because this changed. It used to be an embryo before that. It was a sperm, and then it was food before that, and it still is food. And <laughs> this can't be the ultimate truth of what I am. You know, then, this exists. Then, this apparently. Then what is it? You're going to be screwed here because the only thing it could then be is illusion. Yeah, well, it is. Then, it is to me illusion. It's sort of like, well, it's illusion. It's, but it's, it's really hard illusion. to claim like, yourself as illusion. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, where do you stand this, this to claim yourself as illusion? It's a vibrating pattern of energy. But who the Weak? fuck knows that? <laughs> I mean, who's saying that? Who's saying this is a vibrating pattern of energy? A unique I'm, vibrating I'm not saying it. She's not saying it. <laughs> so, you're saying it. Who's the one saying it? <laughs> <laughs> so all you can end up doing is deny the whole thing. Go, oh, it's just being said. Yeah. But, but the point is, that's not your experience. It's no. not true. It's not, I mean, you can say it. You can, you can mouth the the rhetoric no. but we're, yeah. what we're concerned with what is your gut experience when you leave the satsang and you go home and there's nobody around and you look in the mirror and you you know and you go okay there's nothing here you know really no, I do. Yeah. Now I look yeah. in the mirror and I'll go, what am I looking at? Yeah. You know, what yeah. what what do I see or what is this? Yeah. Okay. What's going on? Yeah. That's the question we're asking here. Yeah. What's going on? What are you seeing? What's what are you looking at? What's looking? What's going on? <laughs> well, I know it's interesting. It I is. Really don't I know. Think it's fascinating. <laughs> I, I, I thought about that, like you see, like the, the inquiry that I was taught is I mean to look. I kind of get the sense that if I come up with anything after is M and R, it's not accurate because it can change, right? So if any words come up, right, unless we can say awareness, because that seems to stay, that's always been, something's been aware, right? But that's a word, but I love qualities of awareness. Okay, well, just it is. It's a game. It's just, all right, awareness. Um, I'm awareness. I am this, the, you know, so I could go with these things, but I feel like if I have a word that's coming up, okay, that's not actually as close to the correct answer as if, my, if what comes up is actually just emptiness, stillness, space like awareness, just. For who? Nothing, nothing. nothing. For, for, who? for whatever's space? asking, whatever's, whatever's coming up, who, for, for nobody. Come on. You see, you're screwed. You are you're screwed, totally aren't you? Screwed. <laughs> You're totally screwed. What can you do? Yeah, who gives a shit? <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. I don't know. That's yeah. been like the question that I ask. I feel like, you know, somebody, That's the fundamental question. Who gives who, a shit? Who, Ramesh wrote a book about it called Who Cares? Yeah. And, and which is a great double meaning. Yeah. Who yeah. cares? Yeah. And, and then, and I, when I look, I feel like, you know, I 
and I look, and if I if I go by the criteria of that which never changes, it, if the word because that's I, not I, true, that's a concept. Okay, it is a concept. You're right, but it's I'm but, but I'm using the concept. But if you're using it as to, a criterion, you're screwed. Well, I'm using it as like a thorn to help me get to. You know what I mean? To, to I'll, I'll throw that away too, I suppose. That'll that'll just be tossed. Maybe right. Okay. Or that one seems to be embedded pretty good. What who gives a shit? Oh yeah. No, no. The <laughs> the 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 true what is true, truth truth never, is that yeah, it's my never favorite. Changes. I I'm a quote so, collector and I love that one. That's so, like, uh, so that's juicy. So that's the thorn that's embedded. You can never know if the truth never changes. How do you know? Well, you know, so I've talked to somebody about that. It was my cousin, actually, who was talking to her. <laughs> anyway, and, you guys can discuss this after okay, the talk okay. and we'll figure it out between you. Yeah, I, I wouldn't trust somebody whose truth changed too much. So. <laughs> <laughs> How to let go of those concepts? How to just let, let go? Of those concepts? Just, because when, you're, when you start... You just have to try harder. <laughs> you know, let go harder. <laughs> well, it's the only, only thing you can do. Does it feel like there's like certain levels? Um, like on some level, there are one one set of rules. On the on another level, I mean, the consciousness and um, how we perceive the world and everything else. Does it feel like? Um, I just feel like it's uh, several levels. Like on some level, there are one rules on on the another level is another. But on on like the basic level, everything is the same. Everything is the consciousness. I mean, you can con conceptualize it that way, so we can talk about it. But ultimately, it's that's a concept. It's a concept. Yes. When you're talking about levels. When you're talking about truth, as Lao Tzu said, the Tao that can be named is not the true Tao. The truth that can be known is not the truth. Do you feel really connected to your body? Um, it depends uh, what you mean by connected. Um, I'll try to uh, explain. <laughs> uh, a lot of followers of Advaita and non-duality, they think that everything like is a consciousness and they start being in contact with, they, they stop caring, You're not not a lot, but some, some, they stop, stop giving that much importance to the material world, to their bodies, to being connected to their bodies. And um, actually, mm -hmm. Um, your, your body can really help you to get to feel and understand, not understand, but to experience what you're talking about. It can, it can be a vehicle, it can be an obstruction. How to discern? <laughs> Only in retrospect. Right. Only after the fact. Then you say, oh, that was an obstruction. <laughs> that was a, that helped. But you... Going forward, you can't uh, tell. Just follow your energy. Which I'm gonna How can you away. not? How can you not? <laughs> it, it's your, the energy which propels you doesn't require you to follow it. The, the say, saying that I'm following my energy is a claim. The energy is what it is. The energy is what is playing out. And then the then comes the claim. Oh, I'm letting go. I'm following my energy. I'm being here now. <laughs> Whatever it is, when there's the sense that I'm responsible for that, I'm offering that. Call the claim of ownership. I'm shutting up my um, inner dialogue. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. If, when there is the claim that whatever is happening, you are responsible. That is the claim of authorship. And it can attach to anything. 
the most sublime teachings, when the false sense of authorship gets holds on, gets attached to it, we have it's the same result. I'm the one who has to unfuck myself. Trying to feel not to understand, but <laughs> the pointer is that whatever is going on with you, the, the attempt to understand is happening. You're not responsible for that either. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> That's that is happening. This moment, the teaching, the, your inquiry, the seeking is playing out in this way. And it goes like this. Where it will take you? Well, we'll just have to see. Uh, how was your, your bodily response? in my response for the earthquake. When did it happen? If you were here, I don't know if you were no, here. No, I was in Europe. Um, okay. But I have been in an earthquake, and my body reacted with fear. Yeah. I'm like, damn! Was, what if this <laughs> building comes down? I mean, it's yeah. rattling above me, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was, you know, there's a roof over me. Mm -hmm. like, it, my body felt threatened. There was danger. That was the perception. There was a perception of danger. How, how is it the mind, your mind reaction? Like at that moment? Yeah. My, at that moment, my reaction, my mind's reaction was for my children who were in another room. Mm. That was my first thought. But that's simply how I'm programmed. I, don't, I think I already talked to you about that. I don't remember it anyway. I'm going to have to tell it again because it's coming up in my mind. Because like I did, she did it to a lot of vipassanas and, and in the end of the course we hear that um, the when once enlightenment happens and that come, comes you just simply, oh, look, that's coming. And then you're happy and you're um, experiencing that, like, as a um, the sensation, then, and, but you're still in a quantity to the situation. So that, that's why I ask you about that. So I cannot comment on what some other teacher teaching is saying because it could be a very potent pointer to something, or it could be a very limited understanding that the person is putting forward to you. And there's teachers who are very profound and others that are clueless. Which one you're gonna get, you don't know. <laughs> there's some really impressive clueless teachers out there with big methods and big, you know, uh, followings and all kinds of tapes and uh, DVDs and uh, programs, you know, that lots of people follow and they're clueless. I mean, they, follow. and because, and what they're saying is essentially the same thing that a master has said, without the understanding. So, the... So you got the lyrics for that, don't we? Yeah, because Ramesh always says, you said also, that nothing changed in life in the organic life, the daily basis life. So, if earthquake happens, you will have, have fear and have thoughts about Oh my God, I'm gonna die, or whatever. So that has nothing to do oh, with the, the understanding of the, the authorship. Yeah. So.
There is no enlightened behavior. Let's just put it that way. If you look, if you're looking for a specific behavior, and say, ah, he's he's not enlightened. He did that. That's it's just simply not. There, there isn't any such behavior because what is what is this what we talk about is enlightenment in this teaching is the absence of the secondary involvement in the behavior and so that you can't see so you don't know whether it's there or not now, if there's resonance, you may experience that absence. But it has nothing to do with the behavior. idea that truth is just the goodness, the underlying goodness. And um, I don't know, sometimes when I listen to you talk, like it feels like it's not that. Like it can really fuck you over. Or, you know, it's not inherently benevolent. Um, so... I feel like I'm evolving spiritually. Uh -huh. so I feel happier and happier and good, more confident, good and confident. Okay. So I don't know if the, like the, the goodness feeling is, you know, I don't know what it is exactly. Well, I'm glad you're feeling better and you're more confident. Your life is more positive. I'm delighted. Yeah, and and, and you, but, you you were also seemed pretty happy. And, and depends on the day, right? <laughs> but, but I, I, I highly doubt you go through the human mood. So just like just the, the ordinary. I have mood. really shit days. I have but days where I get like, a, I wake up and I go. Life sucks. It's just you know you just have shit colored glasses. I don't know whether it's hormones or, or or blood sugar or you, you know I mean, just things. You just wake up and things look shitty. You know, it's just like to a human part of the mechanism of. And in other days, you wake up and it's just like wow. Yeah. You know, everything you just feel real positive and everything seems you know really like going your way and it's all cool and you know and the circumstances haven't changed from you know I mean overall you know and the the fact is that life is change That's why. Yes, I agree. And, you know, what goes up comes down, and what goes this way yes. goes that way. And, and it's just the, the healthy become sick, and the sick become healthy, and the that which is born dies. And these, this is like how it, how it works. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> do, do you not do you not feel what I'm saying? Like, is there not an inherent goodness to this? I don't know what you mean by goodness, you see. I mean good when I hear Whenever I hear the word good, I immediately think of bad. I mean, I, the two don't can't exist in my consciousness without each other. 
So the inherent for something to be inherently good without any bad in it doesn't work for me. I guess I haven't read enough of your books because I don't know because there seems to be a commonality between all teachers and yourself included with the, you know, the roses, positivity, love. Positivity? Goodness. Me? <laughs> <laughs> You've been coming here all this time? <laughs> and roses and positivity? Or... <laughs> no one. Who's been coming here for very long? Can it, there, there's some roses can, there. Can it, those are not roses. They're those lilies. Are lilies. lilies. <laughs> <laughs> there's no fucking roses here. <laughs> I did, there were roses and I threw them out. <laughs> because they started to stink. As does everything. But why the emphasis on Beautiful the, roses. Why, and then they started to stink. Why the emphasis on the positive? I don't emphasize the positive. <laughs> okay, then your book covers... I see six. <laughs> well, trying uh, to sell books is another thing. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta, you gotta <laughs> reel the people in. It's some bullshit in order to get them reading. But I you know. would love to be happy and just joyful and complete. I would love for you to be happy and joyful. <laughs> complete. Uh, well, that's complete is different. Okay, <laughs> that's not complete. Okay, then maybe we're getting somewhere because. I think what I want most is completeness. Just not needing anything else to make me happy. Just to be on my own and be just like I don't need I don't need anything else. I would wish that for you. <laughs> that kind that kind of peace, which is present regardless of whether you wake up in the morning thinking, the world <laughs> sucks. This is horrible. <laughs> Or whether you wake up going, ah, right, you know, it's such a beautiful life is so beautiful, you know, that the peace is there regardless of the circumstance. That's the peace that surpasses all understanding. Yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, but as soon as we talk about it, we think we understand. As soon as we imagine. What that is, it's not it. But you do feel connected to me. No, I do not <laughs> feel connected. It's all. It's all. It's all. To connect, yeah. to be connected to something, you have to be separate from it. Mm. It really doesn't make sense. You're right. You're absolutely right. It does not make sense. Yeah, you feel absolute peace despite your okay. shitty days. There is peace. What does I that don't mean? Feel peace. What does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. It's a pointer. I don't get it. Good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> I'm delighted you don't get it. I'm not concerned with you getting it. All I'm concerned with here in this teaching is pointing you to look so that you'll not get it, not understand it, not figure it out, but to see it, which is an entirely different process. Yeah, you you call it peace. Because I'm using language. I'm Why, why use that word? <laughs> no. Why use peace? Because when I say fricknack, you don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so really, I mean, it's worthless, it you know. Well, it's, it's, it's clearly not worthless because you choose to use the word, the word peace and peace has a connotation. So that has some connection to what you're saying. It has some usefulness, perhaps. But the problem is it also has, contains... Along with its usefulness comes a big obstruction, which is you go, ah, okay, it's peace. I know what peace is. Now I know what it is. Okay. You see? Yeah. That's where the, 
the word then becomes no longer a pointer. It becomes an obstacle. Mm -hmm. So... So I guess I know when I have, when I will completely get it. I I guess I just want to have any questions and you know, and I'll just be that, happy in a that is sense. True. The questions will not arise. But thoughts may be present. Let's hope thoughts are present. <laughs> If, 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 there's no, if there's no thoughts, then you're going to be institutionalized because you can't function. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for saying that. But when I look at stuff, like once in a while I'll see something from Nisargadatta or Ramana Maharshi, because this seeker has looked at stuff on Facebook, and, and it's like... On Facebook? This place. Fuck, when no. it's on Facebook and attributed to, to Nisargadatta Maharaj, is like... <laughs> He didn't say that in a million years. Somebody wrote, made a meme and put Nisargadatta Maharaj underneath it. And everybody went, oh, Maharaj said, you got to love this or that. Well, not it's necessarily. Like, they might have gotten, pulled it from I and that, and he actually did say it. No. no? Sorry. You're saying that, that, that... That there's all kinds of... If I'm saying there is fake God, news on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> I, I hate to, I really hate to break your bubble. I, on no, this he one. didn't break my bubble. There's no bubble broken. <laughs> the, 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 okay, it's, it's the, all good. Well, no, it's so just that I'm like, well, I look at quotes and I see stuff like that and I see things like, yeah, no thought. I'm like, how is that possible? Because, like, Ramana would teach and Mr. Grotto would teach and all these guys, they, they, they would teach stuff and they had to have a thought and be able to say anything. That's right. Right? So they can't be complete. Sorry. They can't be completely thoughtless. It just can't be true, you know. Any more than when Maharaj said, I was never born and I will never die. Right. I'm awake even when I'm asleep. He said all of that stuff. He, he actually said those things. I'm yeah, sure yeah, of it. Yeah. yeah. But he's not talking about the body or so, the mind. He's talking about what <laughs> comes before. Right? Yeah. But he said those words. So yeah. now it's what happens to those pointers after they are put out there and all kinds of stuff happens that's also what i wanted to ask you about never was born and never will die all feeling of it no but he is correct he described what he feels no, uh, no, I mean uh, this condition. It's uh, will be same features. You cannot describe them differently. Uh, you can, but it's really all I can. It's poetry. It is not descriptive prose. When he says, "I was never born and I will never die," he was not describing his experience. No. He was pointing to something, poetically, not literally. I promise you.